So who is on our panel tonight? In addition to Kamalesh, we have Jan Biller. Jan Biller is business owner, social media support and social media community manager at Swisscom. He is not a mother but a father. <laughs> he is the father of the Swisscom support community. The company's hugely successful peer-to-peer -peer customer support platform. Then we have Patrick Kramer. Patrick is head of e-channel strategy at UBS. <coughs> and a large part of his role is focused on driving the firm's social media strategy. And he's been very busy these last few months and probably years building up solid governance and capabilities, including also setting up a media intelligence utility. Then we have Brian Rüber. Brian is from ZHW School of Management and Law. He's actually the head of the Institute of, uh, of Marketing Management and Lecturer for Marketing. Brian has a very strong business background in strategy and technology. And he has also built up and managed uh, a number of companies in the telecom, mobile and high-tech sectors. One of his focus areas is customer relationship management and another one is also marketing and innovation management. So he will be able to provide us some input from the innovation side. And last but by no means least, Mike Schwede from Schwede and Schwede. Mike is an independent social and digital strategy consultant. He spent almost all his life um, doing digital stuff. In 1998, Mike founded a very successful e-marketing agency that was called Orange 8 Interactive. Some of you might remember that. Orange 8 Interactive was later bought by Goldbach Group. And uh, Mike's been an independent consultant now since 2012. He's also lecturing at various schools on social media strategy and digital strategy, and he manages several startups. His special areas of interest are strategies, monitoring, he's heavily also into analytics and the ROI question, and his very favorite hobby at the moment, I think, is intention marketing, which is a marketing approach that actually does not put the customer at the center of marketing, but at the very beginning of marketing might be able to tell us a little bit more about that later on. So we have heard it tonight and we have also seen it in the video. In the longer run, a company's social me media activities will add real value to a business only um, if it is actually linked up with the business strategy of the company. This might sound very easy and logical, but all of us who are involved in actually developing and implementing social media at our companies know that it is a very hard journey. And before we even start the journey, we should know where we are actually heading. And now comes my first question to Kamalesh. When is a business actually social? Um, that's a good question, Carla. <laughs> um, uh, for me, a business is actually social when social technologies are deeply embedded within the organization and it does contribute to delivering business results. So that's kind of one way I would describe it. It also has to be um, embedded within the business operations in terms of looking at um, the people, the processes, the uh, support structures that you have, um, engaged management and so on. Mike, what's your view on that? When is the business social? When is the business social? <coughs> I think when the business uh, really integrates signals from, from, from customers and is able to execute it uh, until the end, until the product or the service is delivered. So focuses on humans and social and interactions. And so the main point, if I understand both of you correctly, is the actual full integration of everything that's being done in social media with what's going on inside the company in terms of business activities. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Now, Kamala has shown to you the social media maturity matrix before. You all have it on your seats. And I would like to make a short exercise with you. And just out of curiosity, I'm wondering, the people who are in the room tonight, which level of social media maturity has your company actually reached? Those who think that company is still at awareness phase, please lift their hands. Uh -huh, all aware. One. Those who are already in the listening phase, raise your hands. Few more, few more, few more. Who is actually communicating? Support. One. Engage. Ah, oh, oh, I'm impressed. Okay, it seems that most of you are either still at the quite at the beginning, somewhere between awareness and listening, or then quite advanced already in the support or actually engagement phase. Does that surprise you, Brian? No. <laughs> um, I, I just recently sat together with a few business leaders and uh, we talked about... Um, what could be the topic of, of an upcoming event next year. And uh, I, I had a deja vu to use a French word uh, when you spoke uh, before Kamalish. Um, they, one guy said, why don't we talk about social media? And then all the, re the others re reacted and said, oh, leave me alone with that topic. I cannot stand it anymore. I cannot hear it anymore. And, uh, and then we went further on and said, well, what are you current problems that you're looking at right now and one said well we need to be uh, better understanding our customers or another said B2B he said we need to understand the customers are of our customers another said uh, we need to be more efficient we're, we're, we're getting worse and worse uh, we need to speed up and collaborate better and another said um, well we need to innovate new products new service offerings and we ended up discussing how social media can help them to reach these goals. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what you said before is exactly, is exactly true. Um, social media um, being narrowed down to, to uh, hit rates and, and clicks and, and uh, they, they will not respond to business leaders. But once you talk about real business goals and how social media can help you to reach these goals, it's not the only answer but it might help to reach these goals. And we ended up discussing social business. They will all buy a book now. <laughs> <laughs> happy to hear that. <laughs> um, there's not only the companies that should be ready actually to engage, but also the, uh, the actual consumers. How engaged are the Swiss consumers? Armin. <laughs> 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 Do you want to delegate the question mm. to Armin? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think not that well, much. I mean, if I recall the slide, uh, mm -hmm. you say, you know, the direct engagement with brands is rather low. Mm -hmm. With so the brands, rather with low. With the brands, but, but among users, consumers, social consumers, it's, it's pretty high. Yeah. So you check what all the think about, you know, some product services. Mm -hmm. And it gets higher as companies can... Uh, reach expectation or over, um, or uh, how can I say, um, meet the expectation, expectations and exceed the expectations. Yeah. But actually that says a lot if the, if the people in Switzerland are engaged with each other on social media but not engaging enough with companies. It says a lot, we can read a lot into that in terms of how well companies are using these channels to communicate with their customers. And the data kind of directs, points in the direction that it's not really doing that well. Yeah. well I would say Switzerland is a highly social country, so people <laughs> talking to each other, word of mouth was always important for buying decisions, especially in Switzerland, I would say with all these local communities. Uh, so they went online, and I think they're highly engaged. Um, between each other, but they're not so engaged with, with brands, and that's completely normal. So um, I always look at the teens, US teens, so there are only 6% of US teens which are interested in interacting with brands. So they must say, I'm not interested, 
worldwide it's uh, 25 percent which are interested in engaging with brands the rest is highly interested in engaging uh, in the networks with their peers but not with the brand <coughs> that's because of classical reasons privacy I don't want to get spam and if you look on Facebook more or less uh, I would say 70% of the Facebook pages are pretty boring um, not well done not well executed there are some which uh, meet uh, the interests or the expectations or even exceed it but there's only few I would say in Switzerland which are doing this right now mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. I would like to put the question to Jan I mean, you are really very close to your customers. You know what's going on on your platform. Maybe you can tell the audience um, in a few sentences what that platform is and how successful it is. And then also tell us how far you think your company is as far as okay. maturity is concerned. Um, our support platform, Swisscom Support Community, is more or less a forum. But uh, what's the difference behind that is that it's really an active community that engages together with other customers but also with us and we are quite successful with it and it's really intervened to the rest of the online experience so the user generated content is really deep embedded within our rest of the online experience and we have really a good foundation of basis of super users that have a strong interest in the topics and they uh, contribute between 40 and 60 percent of everything of all the content they spend hundreds of hours each month on our platform and they are really happy and really engaged. And as you say, it's in between, like it's our company, it's a platform mm -hmm. that we provide, but we always tell you it's your platform, you can talk about our products and uh, what they do, they always say, um, we discuss like topics that are we interested in and on the same time we give support to people who need help. So um, basically, I think we are quite far uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, on the level, but um, there's a lot of more potential uh, still there. So if you have a good community, and we started with a community with support, this was the main reason, we really had also business goals. One business goal is clearly call reflection. We want people to help themselves instead of calling us. So and this works very well, and we have also a business model behind that. But a part of that, there's a lot of content, a lot of knowledge that is, that is produced within the community, which is so of value for everybody in the company, about our processes, our products. And if you turn the cycle, again, you go back and start a human-centered design process to, to, to produce products and use platforms, there's an idea platform, etc. So there's a lot of potential within the community to do more in the future. Mm -hmm. So what you're basically saying is also going back to what Armin mentioned in his presentation about these like 1% really heavily engaged users and you're kind of yeah. taking advantage of that by providing a peer-to-peer -peer platform where users can actually interact with each other which they are more probable to do than interacting directly with the brand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Patrick, um, a question to you. Um, yes. Where is UBS? And... I would also uh, like to know from you um, what are uh, the next steps that you are planning to take to advance um to develop further along this journey. Mm -hmm. So I think we are probably around communicating. So we started very much with listening. So that was our use case uh, for reputation management purposes. Um, we wanted to uh, use a social, actually, um, all of the media. Um, to understand uh, what people have um, in the mind about, you know, us about the banking industry, etc. Um, so it was basically um, a tool um, that we could use um, for our reputation management work to get insights. Um, and once we um, opened it up and implemented that, um, we also learned that um, actually there was uh, it was a wonderful way on how to capture also uh, the needs. Of um, you know the the consumers um, we interact with. Um, so what we did then is um, we started to um, implement the process on how to triage this sort of information, like ideas that came up on, for instance, you know why is, is your mobile banking application not available on Windows uh, Mobile um, and only on iOS. 
uh, and things like that. So um, we captured that information and distributed it to the different departments. Um, also customer feedback. Um, it's not that we um, don't want to engage with customers uh, in the online space. Uh, it's just that we have certain boundaries uh, when it comes to um, banking, privacy, um, secrecy, etc. That you know we're not allowed um, to actually reply to um, an individual who might be um, recognized as, as a customer for us in the public sphere. So what we did is we captured mm -hmm. the feedback and then response behind, respond behind the scenes. That's sort of the approach that we are taking. Um, communicating, uh, we developed a, a number of different use cases which you actually can find on ubis.com slash social media which describes sort of on how we use different uh, channels and platforms for, for various use cases. Um, most of these use cases are centered around what we call like low risk content. So it's recruitment is sort of a natural um, domain to use social. Um, then we have um, some corporate communications uh, use cases where we um, found that Twitter is actually a tool used very much by journalists. So our initial use case was actually we wanted to somehow connect with the journalists via that platform too and all the use cases as well. Um, support, um, that would be really the next um, level where we would provide customer support um, um, uh, using social um, in a mix of channels. Um, we're not there yet. I mean, it's as I mentioned, just some uh, legal challenges uh, in that space. Um, but it would be nice, I mean, also just a general request uh, to give, you know, some input to help people find the information, etc. Engagement, uh, that's sort of, you know, the ultimate um, level, that's a real dialogue. I think we take that more at the personal level, that's our business model, at least on the private banking side, um, not necessarily in the public. Um, it's also a question, uh, actually I saw one, one um, study that um, a, a student did to ask people, I mean, you know, what to expect from banks in the social um, sphere and the expectations were not so high. I mean, there were some of the use cases that I mentioned before, but they don't want to necessarily do business via social. I mean, at this in Switzerland, we did like, uh, you know, a little poll. Um, it's, it's probably, you know, as far as all these privacy concerns are around, mm -hmm. it's better to take it offline, some of this uh, dialogue. Well, so if, if the expectations are low, then there's more opportunity to exceed. Of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, what next? Um, we, we are just continuing, you know, step by step. Um, it's really um, working with the business, um, uh, supporting them to develop their vision, ideas on how to use, leverage social, actually in an integrated way. So I think, you know, um, social, the social media strategy is then achieved if you don't need a social media team anymore. So when it's integrated, it's like, you know, when has a, a company become digital? If you don't need the digital department anymore, then it's really deeply integrated into their DNA and roots and, and how they operate. So I think, you know, We'll get there, but it will take some more time, and it's all aligned with you know this omni-channel uh, discussion and digitization of the entire company. I mean, there it's also you know we have more to do. Yeah, more to do, a lot to do, I think. Yes. <laughs> Not only UBS, Needing but all help. companies. <laughs> um, uh, also, a question I wanted to put to Jan also um, regarding internal processes also at Swisscom. Um, I imagine it, it can be quite a challenge also to make sure to that the, all the inputs that you get on your community platform to actually channel them to the to the appropriate teams and to make sure that action ex is, is being taken on issues raised by the community. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I want to have that in the goals of each individual, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm fighting for it. No, I think um, there are departments within Swisscom that really see the value of this community. They started kind of a monitoring phase, so they see what, what's, what's said about my product in this community. So they, they see a value out of that. And then in the second phase, they maybe even start to engage. For example, the super users are the best users to, to make better tests, to, to bring new ideas to them. 
let them test, give feedback, do iteration, stuff like this. So there are some people who really use it, and they use it for their, for their daily business. So um, also at Swisscom, we started really a human-centered design uh, thinking. So our products are really, we try to really make prototypes, bring them to customers, and social really helps here. So um, for me, I think, I, want, I don't want to be the person who takes out the stuff. I want that the, the company really uses the platform for their purposes. So this is the support community, which has a lot of content. This is our Swisscom Labs community, where, where ideas, where we can put challenges to customers, ask simple questions. Do you like red or green? So really, people give us feedback here. So we take green. So, so really, like, and people who use the platform, so it's easy to use because they know it. It's social. It works kind of like Facebook. It's, it really helps them in the daily business to use it. But it's a little bit of, uh, yeah, I have to go to people and to convince them. But if there's a use case that convinces people, they really start to use it active, actively. Mm -hmm. Question of measurability of what you are doing. I mean, if we see the support community, there's really some kind of a business case behind that. We have to say there's a lot of knowledge. There are a lot of people who contribute, but it's also that we have we can measure and we measure it across channels, not only for the community that we have uh, an impact on call deflection. So, if someone goes to the community instead of calling a call center, we have a call deflection here. So there is a business model behind uh, the support community. Um, we really can measure it across channels. It's the same uh, measurement we have on our help pages, our tools, customer centers, etc. So there's a there's a model behind that really helps to, 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 to measure everything. In the other cases, we really also still are in a, in a for example, in the innovation part. We are still in a, in a um, phase where we really have to see how, how we can evolve. How, do we, are we faster in innovating? Can we, can we save money instead of going to customers, um, um, use social media? So, so there's also like a case, we really try to find the best case behind that. But in the support community, like in the support case, it's really, um, there's a real business model and KPIs behind that. And how did you get management buy-in for the platform oh, when we you just, started out? We just started. <laughs> uh, the Swisscom support community was the first platform um, that was launched better in Swisscom. So uh, we had a business sponsor and we said, we already had a forum, so we really said, hey, we need to do something here. And we started and the success really overwhelmed us. And now nobody would ever say uh, we don't need it anymore. So, like, we had to have a little startup feeling here to, to, to go further. And this sometimes helps, not always. In our case, it really works. But I think Swisscom also does have a predisposition for innovation, and there are a much younger group as well within the customer care area that are more disposed towards social technologies. Of course. I mean, but it's, it's not only, it's really the whole, you have to find the right people in the company that have the same spirit and do stuff and try to find sponsors. And there's always, there are always some people, you have to speak with that business, as you said, but if you can do that, if you can prove that, you can, you can do something. There's really an innovative culture. There's also trial and error culture, and, and this really helps. Uh, Brian, a question to you. You have dealt a lot with innovation management. Um, in how far do you think um, the changes that we see now with social technologies are different in terms of innovation management for companies? Ooh, um, well, to generalize maybe what, what's happening now to, to many companies is, uh, is that on one, on one side, and social media is also one of the causes, one side, the complexity of the environment environment is, is increasing. So the number of variables that I'm looking at is increasing. At the same time, dynamic is increasing. So speed is picking up. So I need more time because of the complexity, but I don't have more time until things change again to find a, a solution for, 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 the, for the environment. And that's what, um, what many uh, companies are, are dealing with right now. They're, they're lacking time, however, they should need more time because of the complexity. What, what we can do on, on, on our side as a, as a, uh, as a school, uh, we, can, we can help, uh, as a university, we can help uh, companies to, to reduce time and, and also to reduce complexity by measuring. And same as um, Jan said before, 
you built your own lab. So what we're offering as a university is, is use our labs to measure analog and digital, and uh, we're, we're calling it the service lab, um, and, and measuring and reacting and then, and then measuring again and, and, and going into iterative loops and, and approaching um, the, the strategy from that side and not developing strategies for the next five years because no one knows how, how the future will look like in the next five years. So you have to move forward in, in smaller steps, but you have to continuously measure whatever you can measure. And that's, that's probably what has changed, in the, and, and it's going to continue. Speed will pick up and complexity will also continue. It's going to be uh, more complex where we're moving to. So it's the need for speed in these fast evolving technologies versus the long processes of big companies at work. I saw a tweet that you posted today, Mike, um, that was nicely capturing that kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. It's like the social media pioneers really want to move very fast. And then the company with its processes and with a lot of sta internal stakeholders that have to be on board before you can actually do something <coughs> that will have an impact. Mike, what's been your experience with that, with uh, the clients that you have? Oh, it was horrible times. <laughs> <laughs> so, so last year I did a, a social media strategy for, for SPB. Mm -hmm. So there were plenty of I mean, 35 people from different <coughs> departments trying to get on board and uh, yeah, try to develop a strategy. So that was uh, was interesting, challenging, but, but uh, not really efficient. And uh, <coughs> I had other projects, so, so I don't like to do strategies like this kind of strategies to hide from implementation. You can make a lot of paper, people have to read everything. I don't like um, approaches where you don't have a strategy, but I like uh, with a lean strategy approach where you develop a little strategy, you know more or less how to, where to go, what to measure. Um, then you go in, the, in a, a sandbox phase, in a playground, and you try out <coughs> what's really working, because strategy is always bottom up. Social media is completely different, different, so you really have to try and then measure what, what's really working, and then go <coughs> and, and then you can develop a, a bigger strategy. I think that's an uh, important thing, and for the first playground sandbox part, you need the business sponsors, that's the easiest way. Uh, you need some money sometimes from people and just to try out and then uh, to implement it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, a, a, that's a good way how to be fast and try to reduce complexity by reducing the playground to some little projects. Mm -hmm. um. Kamalesh, um, Brian also mentioned the, the, the complexity and, and that need for speed. He also mentioned that also the, 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 the short life of strategies that you have today. How do you find a good balance between being strategic and adapting to the quick changes? Um, basically, actually, I, I agree with Mike quite a bit and as well with Brian in terms of the strategy doesn't have to be, you know, tons of paper and three to five years and, you know, something that's so complex that the average Joe can't actually implement it. So you really want to try and identify something that's a good combination of pragmatic, but also something that has a good direction that's not too short term. And so um, it's quite interesting actually, because when you look at something like a, a social media framework, it does help you create that direction because you're focusing on your business goals. And business goals are longer term. They're not a year, right? They are relatively longer term. And even though the focus might change over time in companies, the business goals tend to be kind of the same. You know, the same few business goals. So if your focus is on the business goal, the implementation of the strategy is not going to focus on channels that might over time um, not be around. So we don't know how long Facebook is going to be there. It could be three years down the line, another company buys it over and it doesn't exist anymore. So the strategy really focuses on your business goals and what you want to achieve. And you find the right balance of um, identifying the direction with that strategic approach and then looking at tactics that are shorter term. So that way you can find this right balance. So I think that speed combined with uh, the, the need to also take small steps is probably a topic that will stay with us for quite a long time. We are almost running out of time now. Um, there's uh, one more aspect I would like to discuss uh, before then going on to the Q&A. 
<coughs> we haven't uh, really talked yet about that the fact that the social consumer is also an, empl an employee of a company and he's also a manager in a company, he might be a third party supplier of a company. Now, if the consumer is changing, so are employees' needs and expectations, so are managers' needs and expectations, third-party providers' uh, needs and expectations. Uh, will it take a whole generation to actually make that change, to make our companies real social companies, Brian? When, when I talk to our, our, um, our students, I have many companies that would like to get in touch with our students because they say, um, I'd like to better understand the, the digital natives and you, you're teaching them. So I invite them to class and, and, uh, and then they find out that the so-called digital natives, they're, they're human beings. <laughs> <laughs> they play football and they play ice hockey and other sports and music. and. And they also, and the students react like that, they don't want to be looked at as digital natives. They're a lot analog, there's a lot more analog around them than digital. And um, I think that's, that's what we, we, need to be, we need to understand when we also look at these resources um, as employees. And um, um, they're digital, they're analog, and both at the same time, and, and that's probably what we have to understand and, and not think just about being di purely digital or purely <coughs> social, it's it's all it's all uh, always everything at the same time, and and that's how probably um, our our employees will evolve, our employees our our capabilities will evolve. I had discussion uh, over lunch today with the business leader. He said um, we need to build up more capabilities, uh, a lot more capabilities in our marketing department. Um, and I was wondering what exactly, and he said, well, we need to be more analytic and we need to be able to cope with technology. It's a lot more technology now. And another guy said, uh, another business leader said, yeah, 20 years ago, he was an older person, 20 years ago, a marketing guy, he didn't need to, to be able to count. And nowadays, <laughs> marketing guys, they, they need, to, need to be able to count, they need to be able to use technology and, and, and have all different skills. As a university, we permanently have to go along with uh, what what the customers want, what the what the what our um, what the employers want, and um, and therefore we're we're building in new feet, new new technologies and new skill sets in in the in all our programs. Mm -hmm. Well, Swisscom with by the young workforce probably has a quite an advantage there. No, I mean you know the segment that calls the most using the telephone. Are the, the young people, 16, 18. We ask them, what do you That's do? You have a problem. You, we call. But they also use the messenger to, 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 to chat with one friend. Then they use Skype to, 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 to talk to another, to another one. Then they have an international friend they use for Facebook. So they, they jump in the channels. And, and we at Swisscom, we just say, uh, I mean, we say we, are the, we want to be the, the, the companion in the digital world. So for us, it shouldn't matter where he comes from. If he wants contact with us on our platforms with other customers, he should have the access, he should have the platform, we should listen, we should be on the same level with this customer. And But he can change, he can do everything. He can come call us, he can come to the shop, he can call the community. He should experience about the same thing, the same values we, we want to represent. And But this is also the channel, I mean, uh, the, 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 the challenge to, 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 to measure, to, to bring, it's, it's, I mean, if you have a good Twitter team, it's, it's a, it happened a lot with telcos, especially uh, in the beginning when they started support, for example, BT. They, they had a team that, does, that, that did Twitter, and people find out, oh, those are the best agents. You get the fastest response, and if you have any problems, go to this channel. Because, But, you know, if you have more and more and more uh, uh, requests, you have to handle them, and you all don't have always the best people. And that's, again, that's the company, that's the mm -hmm. culture. How can you... And, and I'm with you. In, in a few years, maybe in five, in ten, whatever, a whole company should be more... I think we don't have dedicated customer care agent for social media anymore. We have employees that answer the questions for the customers, internally and externally. Yeah, so that's then the point where we don't need the social media team anymore. Yes, I yes. find another job. <laughs> <laughs> 
you will have evolved by then too. <laughs> so we are ready, I think, to take a few questions from the audience. Yes? Uh, beyond concerning your platform or your lab, uh, you mentioned as an example that you would like or that you actually do um, let the people elect or select between green and red, whatever was just an example. But how do you really make sure that those customers that actually really um, need the platform or really work with the platform are representative for your whole customer base? I mean, do you do like something like market research there? Or, I mean, I think it's pretty anonymous there. there so, like, it really, I mean, this is like kind of an experience we have. I mean, also with usability online. I'm, I'm, I'm a user researcher, originally, usability user research. And we did a lot of research about online versus offline. And we see, really, and we did it again a few days ago, we did an online and, an online and an offline usability research. And we found about the same things in, in, those, different, in those different methods. So, of course, the community is always uh, uh, a part. It's, they are more engaged, uh, whatever. But you can also think about to, to, to recruit people and say, go to the platform and do it. It's about the platform. It's an online tool. It, most of the time, uh, um, we have, you need a fast feedback. And, and if you compare it to the rest, it's, it's a lot of time similar. But of course, I mean, a super user that has five routers at home, a fiber, uh, copper, and uh, ISDN, uh, and 17 mobile phones behaves different than an average customer. But 1991, you have to find customers and tell them, it's easy, go there, just answer this quick question, do the mechanical trick, and, and thank you very much. I think the people are used to it and they want to do it and, and they, they appreciate to give feedback. So, so the challenge is really to bring more people on the platform, average people. I think Mikro has about the same platform, for more for innovation, mm -hmm. and they, 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 they are representative. But what we saw in the usability test is uh, if you take six, eight, ten people, you already get so much feedback, that's about 80-90%, the average person would, would say also. So you don't need to be <coughs> representative in the kind of market research uh, companies uh, saying it has to. So it, it can be a peer group and it's mm -hmm. important feedback. Mm -hmm. Yes? I think probably a question for Patrick is his brand is closest, I guess. Switzerland has lots of luxury brands, and by their nature, they're sort of exclusive. So in a way, you might call them anti-social, or they want to be exclusive. Are there any brands that shouldn't be using social media? I don't think so. I think any brand can use social media. The question is whether you know you use social media in a public way, or you want to create this you know exclusive circle. I mean. We have some uh, examples of, of social networks which are exclusive. I'm not sure if they're very successful. Um, they're a little bit antisocial, but uh, it works. <laughs> they're trying even to, to you know, uh, position themselves as a gateway for those luxury brands to access this exclusive circle. Um, oh. there, there are actually lots of brands that call themselves exclusive that do use social media. So if you look at um, companies like Jimmy Choo, Jimmy Choo, Yves Saint Laurent and so on, they are more exclusive as in not, the products are not accessible to the average person, but they do use social media and the key to it is really identifying who your target audiences are and really trying to engage with those target audiences. One example I like to use all the time is um, Harley Davidson for example. So Harley Davidson is a very good example of um, an engage, a company that engages really well with their user community because um, not everyone owns a Harley and having a Harley really is a user experience. So it's not just owning a bike but it's a, a lifestyle change that you have. So that's really a, a good example of, you, you should actually go and check out their Harley Davidson um, online you should help me, you're a Harley driver, right? <laughs> they're, they're everywhere. Online, yeah, All the, over the, the place. Online I magazine. mean, on Facebook, they have their whole exactly. um, Harley Owners Group community. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're, they're a really good example online of how you actually build the social media channel into the lifestyle of the customer. So for example, I love Hublot. 
Uh, and when you buy in blue, you get a little card, an exclusive golden card. Or, uh, yeah, it was golden. And then you can log in in a, in a, in a, in a community, which is exclusively for blue owners. Mm -hmm. So it's not they have a Facebook page, or they are on Twitter, but they have exclusive channels for the owners, for example. Um, so that there are many things how to create exclusivity, yeah. uh, creating desire, but only a few people can buy it. Or the highest exclusivity, I think uh, it's a Nike ID shoe. So I create my own shoe, and yeah. I can buy it myself. So that's also a way how to define ex exclusivity, uh, exclusivity, but you have to de redefine it, I think, in, in a new matter. And you also can evolve customers, I, I mean, develop customers. I mean, a super user, he, he has access to the super user lounge, and he can test maybe a mobile phone three weeks in advance before it's on the market. I mean, the super users have to do something to get to this level. It's a gamification thing, it's about ranks, it's about reputation, but, but they get something out. They are really closer to the, to the, to the company, they get exclusivity, so, so this is also something that you can play with during the evolution of a customer that is engaging with you. Yes? Question to Patrick. Uh, you to what extent uh, has social media already arrived in your private banking, or to what extent are the relationship managers, finally the guys who, who finally have to sell, are using it? To what extent, for instance, in instance for uh, retention yeah. management? Or yeah. So it, it, it very much um, differs if you look at the company you know, by region. So I would say um, in the US it's much more advanced. There we have, you know, a concrete project um, pilot that was launched, where um, our client advisors have the possibility to leverage social media, specifically LinkedIn, to um, uh, engage, to interact with prospects or clients, um, but all in a very controlled way. So, meaning, you know, we have the regulations, we have records management requirements, uh, the information flow is controlled. Um, you know, there's certain words they're not allowed to use, etc. Um, so that happens within that environment. Um, in in other regions, um, it it really depends. Um, I would say, um, you know, uh, there are client advisors already using it, um, but not officially. That causes actually a risk for the company because we might, you know, um, um, operate outside of, of our regulations. Um, so I would say it's, it's, it's really probably starting to be looked at here in Switzerland but it's not, uh, as I tried to, to say before it's not social media which is the, the buzzword it's more, you know, digital it's omnichannel trying to coordinate between uh, the different uh, channels to interact, platforms, events to bring everything together um, Plus, there are also actually from a client side, uh, in, in certain segments, there are even there's a need to for a bank to facilitate the exchange. You know, if you have like certain interest groups, philanthropy, um, or so certain business networks, where the clients come to us and say, "Couldn't you, you know, open up that group on Facebook or LinkedIn to facilitate the exchange of information for us to network also." in a virtual space, and not only when we meet together. Um, may I just add a point there as well? Um, when we look at private banking, for example, uh, it's really interesting because the, there are research and statistics that show customers are actually looking to work more on e-channels for non-complex transactions, for example, and really looking for interaction with client advisors when it comes down to really complex um, transactions, so more complex conversations about their, um, their investments. And there's also a really significant uh, growing market for social trading and social investment sites, for example. And um, those sites are starting to a little bit cannibalize the private banking business because they don't only target the masses, but they, there are also a significant number of people who are high net worth and affluent who are going towards these websites to do their own investment, so to understand investment portfolios and invest on your own. So it, it'll be an interesting question as well, how the banks respond to that. Is there anything particular from Twitter? Maybe just one question. Um, 
we talked a lot about the B2C field. Is there a difference how to engage in the B2B sector with customers? Who wants to answer that? Okay. Um, there, when you say difference, I don't think there's a huge difference. I think it comes down to really understanding your target audiences and what kind of channels they use. Um, there's a good example of a um, weapons developer, a weapons supplier that ha that uses social media and more so to educate people around um, the, the industry itself and what kind of weapons they develop and things like that. And their target audience are really government officials, so not really uh, B2C but B2B. So it's really interesting to look at who your target audiences are and try to find use cases that make sense for those target audiences and channels that um, those people access. And that's how you would actually try to engage on B2B. Maybe one additional uh, remark there. Many companies in the B2B field are, are uh, using social media to understand the customer's customers. So to, to better understand your customer, you better should know who your customer's customers are and, and to monitor um, what's happening in, in their markets to better respond to their, their market needs. So it's more an indirect, uh, indirect monitoring that, that is uh, that, that is happening there. What I saw now and 15 years before, we, where we have to explain that internet is something important. Um, I, 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 see, I see a bit of similarity in B2B. It was uh, so the B2B people don't adapt as fast as consumers do. But uh, when they change, they change really fast. So as, as a company, I think in social media, B2B, if you listen and see, okay, no one's talking about us, <laughs> uh, <coughs> you could say, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's get ready internally. So do social media uh, internally in the enterprise, get ready to, con ta yeah, to take uh, uh, conversations. And then when your customers are ready, you're always the pro, uh, already the pro. So that's, I think, a bit of the difference. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes, you one last one. Are not engaging with brands, with people, people in general. Is that not a, a cultural problem as well? Emerging no. markets. Uh, yeah. I think emerging markets say you, are, you look till, uh, to the brand and it's something really special, and here it's like it's cool to have a no name product. Um, but um, so I think that that's a little difference, but uh, the way is clear. The brand won't be the, the sender, it will be the receiver, and that's the big problem of uh, when companies in, in implementing social media, they don't create communities, they just create Facebook and shout out, that's not social media. <coughs> I, I mean, I was also surprised that, that, that there's really such a big community behind our brand, our product. I mean, we sell products of, of Apple, of Samsung, whatever. So, it's it's a big field. So, but but I think it's in those communities, and especially in telco, I think it's it's quite similar to, to other to other countries. That, that there is there are people with a certain interest. They want to have a platform where they can exchange, and, and I think that's that's uh, kind of a unique thing that happens. Everywhere. I think as well, it's it's definitely not a cultural issue because there are brands that do engage well, for example, Swisscom. It's really about trying to identify um, how to best engage with those customers. And taking into consideration cultural factors, yes, but it, I don't think it influences it as much um, to the point where people don't engage on social media for that. Okay, thank you very much. We've come to the end of tonight's event. Yes, a big applause for our <laughs> panelists. <laughs> Many thanks to the presenters, to the panelists, and um, our special thanks goes also to all those who has helped us organizing the event, all the guys at Zeta AV who have helped us uh, preparing and preparing the event and make this uh, come alive. Thank you very much.